function. Instagram, welcome back. What's up, Instagram? Another episode of Elise TV, Instagram, Facebook, Instagram. I want to say thank you for all the followers out there. The response has been amazing, and uh, I appreciate you guys reaching out and grabbing some of these wines that we've been tasting on camera. Um, that is part of this whole game that we play, and the wines that we're going to taste today are definitely available on the EliseWinery.com website. Um, as usual, we will not taste wines that are unavailable when we get to the library wine, the 2000 today. That'll be one of those going, going, gone wines almost but it will be immediately. Available. I want to introduce Dean Williams today. This is kind of a new face for you guys out there. You've seen my mother on a couple of shows. Uh, <laughs> Dean is, is one of our kind of uh, uh, global enthusiasts, for lack of a better, you know, kind of title. Oh, I thought it was a wine enthusiast. Global palate consultation. Ah. What is what is that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the theme today, and, and by the way, Thursday show, start marking your calendar, 2 o'clock, same thing, West Coast time. We're going to be playing around with vintages that didn't get uh, heralded by the press. And the reason we're going to taste off vintages on Thursday this week is I think what we're seeing in the modern era of wine drinkers is more and more people have actually gone to the trouble of developing their own path and drinking their own wine and yeah. not being driven so much by that pursuit of score. Um, it would be like us going to the gas station going, well, I just want 94 point gas today. It's cool, man. I don't need the, I don't need perfect. Um, so anyway, so Thursday is us tasting some of the vintages that might not have gotten the, the big hype flute and press that some of the other vintages did. So log on on Thursday. That'll be another fun one uh, for sure. Today, and I'm going to let Dean jump in and, and talk a little bit about this. Um, today we're talking blend. And when it comes to the wine world, I think sometimes the modern wine drinker keeps getting into this rhythm of flavor. It's like going to Baskin and Robbins going, I like chocolate, I like vanilla. I used to personally like peat bubblegum ice cream because, I mean, you got ice cream and you get to chew bubblegum after. It was like two things. I felt like I was a genius. Just saying. Um, and so when we start talking blends, it's a, for a lot of people, they need ingredients. Like, what is in it? You know, like, what's in the soup? Sometimes for us in the wine business, it's not about ingredients, it's about flavor. And some of these blends, from a winemaking standpoint, from an ego standpoint, if I'm making a single vineyard wine, we talk a lot about the vineyard and how the site drove a lot of the wow factor and what made that site amazing. From a winemaking standpoint, when you're making blends, there's a different pride you take in these wines because we made this. We actually took these components and physically joined them together and said, I think that tastes good together. So there's almost more of a culinary approach to making blends because you're always tinkering with a little of this and a little of that. Yeah. Um, and when in doubt, give it a really exotic name because I think people just really attach themselves to that, you know? Um, so the first one we're gonna taste today, for those of you that know uh, Elise, it is the Ceci Bon, and now, for one of the greatest Ooh. sounds ever invented on the planet. Uh, Mr. Oh, Williams, you want to make sure that is perfect. And uh, while you're tasting, Dean, just start talking a little bit about blends. Absolutely. So, uh, anyone speak French out there? Ceci Bon means it is so good. And this one is. Uh, this continues every vintage to be in my top three wines that, uh, uh, that we make. Um, and it's what's known uh, in the industry as a GSM blend um, because it is a blend of Grenache, Syrah, and Mourvedre. First uh, letter in each of those grapes, so it's easier to say GSM than Grenache, Syrah, Mourvedre every day. And this is a wine that, uh, are a blend, a recipe, if you will, that originated in the Rhone region of France where uh, over time, uh, you would learn what grapes grew best in that soil and evolved to make the best wine. So, uh, where's the Rome region of France? Uh, it's in France. Nice. <laughs> the big part? <laughs> the big part. It's near Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that uh, skipped a lot of geography, uh, and for anybody that actually went to school that still teaches geography, uh, the Rhone Valley is right on the Mediterranean. So what you're getting is not only a wine country influence, but all of what happens in North Africa travels across the Mediterranean and affects heat and wind. So what's the what's the French word for the winds that come off of Africa? Uh, the Le Mistral. Le Mistral. And in Italy, it's Sirocco. It's the, yeah. the winds that make you crazy, right? Yes, oh, yeah. Le um, so yeah, I mean, the Rhone Valley. Two different personalities, north to south. 
Yeah, uh, north is uh, Syrah dominated, south is Grenache dominated. Why? I don't why? know. Why? 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 It just is. Me. Heat? Temperature? Heat. Serrata is better. Reputation? Heat. Cooler right. people? Like, you know? Food. Yeah? Yeah. 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 It's all around the food. A lot of what we run into with blends is if you're going to make 100% wine, you need that single site to give you everything. You need the you need the full mouth feel, you need the aromas, you need the textures, everything on that site. That is literally how we decide whether to make a single vineyard wine or whether to blend. The warmer the location you're going to grow your grapes in, typically you're not going to get that longer hang time. They're not going to survive the heat and they turn into raisins far later on into the season where you're not going to make a delicious wine from them. So now I'm in this hot area, and especially anybody that's been to the south of France and Chateau Neuf and a little north of that Gigandas, and these aren't even soil. I mean, you've been there, you've traveled the planet. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. This, I mean, walking through these vineyards must be the greatest ankle workout ever invented on this planet. They, you are walking on these ostrich egg rocks from the old riverbeds, yeah. and you see these gnarled vines growing out of these rock gardens, and they're making these exceptional wines. It's one of the things I've always loved about the wine business in that we... If you grew up in farming country and you see that fertile, rich soil, you know, you're like, we're living in farmland, you know? You get into the wine business, you go to the worst, rocky, hill-strewn, pebbly vineyards that have no ability to grow tomatoes or pumpkins, but they're cranking out the greatest flavor yeah, of wine. And these ever. rocks hold uh, heat. So the whole idea is heat by contribution. You harvest a little earlier. Now, I can't get... Bang, 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 six levels of flavor from a warmer site. I need to harvest those grapes earlier so we don't lose them to the heat. What am I going to do? We blend. You start playing with one grape gives you a little of the pepper. One gives you the salt. One gives you the flesh. One gives you the sweetness. One gives you the, you know, all they, they contribute all these different elements. And so now you get to be the mad scientist. You're making, you're making that, you know, you got all your vineyards laid out. Um, and you start tinkering until I think you get what would be a recipe that you can kind of run with, you know. The Cessi Bon, this is the 2018. Uh, those of you that know the wine, the 17s came and went in the blink of an eye. Part of these kind of wines are so easy to drink. This is your, what are the three P's, Dean, of the wine business? Um, I don't know. What are the three P's? Pool, patio, and porch. Porch, the triple P powder. Thank you. Well, it'll be a quadruple pounder well, that you know, started with a P, but it doesn't. Like me, I always say it's 95% this and 10% that. You guys always want to catch me on the math, man. Triple you know? P powder. Um, the whole thing is, is we're not making light of the wines. They're still very seriously made, but the thing is there are certain bodies of wine where your brain drinks it and goes, I just want to kill everything in that bottle right now. I want to drink that entire bottle to my head. They're just juicy, delicious, easy to kind of drink wines. Um... And so the Ceci Bond is really designed for that. It's released. It shows up on your doorstep. It's gone. Yeah. You know, I need more of that immediately. So whatever you're thinking about ordering today, double it, and that'll pretty much be about what you need. You know what's great about this one, Chris? You can actually chill it in the summer. So it's it, it it's so soft and tan, and you know that that nice bitter bump to the fruit in red wines. This is so light and tannin that the fruit pops, and when you chill it, it doesn't get all bitter. You chill a cab down, it's bitter. The fruit just... And I can, I can totally testify that that bottle fits in that little cup holder in your inflatable raft in the pool, by the way. Yeah. So if you want to just tuck that bad boy in while you're bobbing in the water... I know I'm not saying you should be drinking in the pool. Let's everybody calm down out there. But you should, yeah. Well, it doesn't fit in the cup holder, so you have That's to... That's why you put the glass the on the edge of the pool, right? And that way you're not drinking in the pool. You're drinking next to the pool, you know, but yeah. Uh, but no, blends in general, this is the whole thing that's fun is you can make a blend soft and drinkable. You can make it spicy. You can make it tannic. You can make it sweet. Like you've got all these options to play with with all the different grapes coming at you. Yeah. Um, the Ceci Bon grown in very warm areas for us, primarily Grenache, little Syrah, a little Merved, but the Grenache is really the key. So again, anybody that's ever been to the south of France, there's this little region just north of Chateau Neuf known as Gigandas, and they specialize in these gorgeous hillside Grenaches. And the Grenache Rosés of the summer are just absolutely one of the great wines. So a lot of the times the Elise Rosé that is absolutely rocking right now uh, is made from the pink version of some of these red wine vineyards. Yeah. Um, for that absolute Grenache just makes one of those really great rosés uh, for, for summertime drinking. So the Ceci Bon is that perfect. People are showing up to the house. I got random hors d'oeuvres going. There's nothing on the planet you can't put on a plate where Gigandas doesn't go, oh, I really like that. I'm good with that. Yeah, perfect cocktail party wine. Uh, 
great intro into maybe some more serious wines that you're going to have later with dinner. Do we want to talk about the flavor profile of this? Or? My friend, I would love for you to do that. I would love to do it too. So, uh, we mentioned before, this is just a really light, fruit-forward wine. Uh, so I've described it as light to medium body. In the nose, there's just these beautiful dried rose petal, raspberry, cranberry, juicy cherry. It's just, it's, it's, it's perfumed and it's sexy. Just like you, Dean. Just. <laughs> yes, friends, just like me. Um, the wine finishes dry, but it's just this really soft, uh, sexy pop of fruit. And on the palate, it's more like um, black strawberries. You know what would go really great with our 2018 Sessi Bond? Mm, besides us, what? How about some Gus's fried chicken out of St. Louis, man? Is anybody cruel cool enough to live in St. Louis right now? Yeah. Uh, it was really funny. I was, I was just telling you, I was re-watching Ken Burns' whole baseball uh, documentary. And... Um, you forget what a baseball town St. Louis is being West Coasters, man, you know. Uh, anyway, it was fun. Jim Zim out there watching us today. What is going on, my friend? Gus's Fried Chicken in St. Helena. Mm -hmm. Or in uh, St. Louis, I should say. Um, kill that. We're moving on. Yeah. So, uh, goes with everything red wine's not supposed to go with, including Cool Ranch Doritos. <laughs> serious. Serious is a heart attack. It's really good. Now. Let's talk about modern translations. I just spent a whole day with my children going through emojis trying to find out what modern language is like. Mm. Um, when this wine was first produced, the next one in our flight today, this is known as Facante. Facante! <laughs> it originally was the fact that the winemaker had such a good friend that had this amazing vineyard that he got access to and made all these great wines from. So he was considered a friend with a benefit. As we have moved forward into modern society, I don't know if friends with benefits is what they were necessarily referring to in this wine, but Facante is a Portuguese reference to having that, that, that blessed uh, ability to, uh, to have your friends around you. And we have all obviously experienced the fact that we are better together than we are alone. That's right. And that actually dovetails into exactly why we're talking about blends today. Um, touch on this wine, Dean. Like, this is a, not a normal blend. People come in and we're talking, even the more experienced drinkers with Syrah and Grenache and Cabin Merlot blends and, and Zin and Charbono and the, you know, all these other great blends out there. This is unique to the wine world. Um, it's only in the last, excuse me for getting this totally wrong, uh, Master Psalms out there, but in the last 15 to 20 years, in my opinion, I have seen more Portuguese vineyards producing dry red wine and not all fortified port. Yeah, well, in, in, in the country of Portugal, they've always done that. Well, they've seen, thank you. have been available to the locals, but very rarely shipped out, so you're absolutely correct. It's just been recently with uh, that you've seen these wines come over here, but we're most familiar with the grapes that are in this wine being made into a sweet, fortified wine known as port. So... Uh, some people get confused when you start talking about uh, Portuguese grapes in port. They think that we're talking about this wine is sweet. It, it, it's not. It is bone dry, but made with those grapes that traditionally are made to be sweet. Uh, so the, the Facante for me, the first thing your nose picks up in this glass is you immediately are thinking you are at a barbecue. There is something about the spice. There's almost an Asian, like a ginger profile in here. There's an interesting Asian spice that runs through this wine. Yeah. Um, super juicy, super delicious. Um, for you vegetarians out there, again, you start throwing the balsamic vinegar, uh, portobello mushroom element to a wine like this, and that will sing like a rock star. Springtime is probably the greatest time to be alive. Uh, uh, the produce that comes out is absolutely unreal. And we often celebrate what you'll call springtime wine and winter wine in, in, in our world. And for me, this just makes me want spring produce, man. Like, I can't wait for the, the sugar beets in the grocery store, and I can't wait for the spring garlic, and I can't wait for asparagus. And I know, I said asparagus, that's right. Asparagus is the enemy of most wine pairing, but you have found if you wrap prosciutto around pretty much anything, and it grill makes it. it. Oh, man. And grill it. Prosciutto around of asparagus rolled over your barbecue. And actually, my personal favorite is in July when peach season kicks in out here. 
you wrap prosciutto around your peaches and grill those and you get the sweet from the peach, the salt from the prosciutto and, and kill something like this ficante. Now, over time, we have turned this into a verb. So you can now say when you wake up in the morning, I think I got totally ficante last night, I man. Like, ficante. I don't know what happened, but yeah. I, I or got... it's the weekend, I'd like to get ficante. <laughs> and for a lot of us out there, I think the hardest decision we're currently making is, at what time of day, now that I'm home all the time, should I really seriously start thinking about that first glass of wine? Yeah. And I found in the first week it was like 5 o'clock, the second week it was 4 o'clock, the third week it was like 10 a.m. Yeah, I just put it on my bed stand now, so I don't have to get up and walk into the kitchen and grab a cork. These were the greatest inventions I ever saw were the new Lazy Boy sectional furnitures that had the ice chest in the arm. I'm like, that's not right. Yeah. <laughs> that's not helping. <laughs> that's not helping. But the other thing about a, 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 a blend, and I, I always compare to, to dogs. Right, Bo? Yeah. Bo. Mutts. Pure brands, okay? Mutts don't have the pedigree, but they can often be the friendliest. Pure brands can be a little trickier and they take a little more understanding. So blends for me are often easy to understand wines. We blend them because they're infinitely drinkable because of the way they've been blended. Um, nobody was sort of walking around going, I really want a Tariga Nacional Red. I'm really thirsty for one of those. Nobody says that. Well, and that's where I think the role of blend sometimes is challenging your wine drinker. Don't yeah. necessarily simply fill the widget. Don't be afraid to put a wine out there. That's not normal. That's not in the, the kind of the, the wheelhouse. Um, and I love this Ficante. I really do. This is a food wine. Every sip of this wine you take, your brain goes in a different direction of what you might do with it or what might work with it. Um, I hate to be a broken record, but if we're in Portugal, so paella is a given with this wine. Yeah, I was going to beat me to the punch. Sorry, go ahead. I'll, no, no, like, no, I'll no, just stand over here. I'll just... Paella. Yeah. yeah. Paella. Great. Uh, cheeses. Uh, dry, sharp cheeses. Rich, salty cheeses. It, it, it does it all. Really dark cherry plum fruit. It's, it, it has this juicy softness to it, but as Chris said, it finishes bone dry. Uh, so you can drink, uh, drink it by itself with that food if you just like that dry finish, but that fruit pops, the dry hits in, and this has a little more acidity than I usually think of uh, red wines having. Um, so again, with food, acidity amplifies flavor. Yeah, for me, acidity meets up with the muscles, that, that dry finish. You get a little juicy uh, yeah. cherries in your, your paella, and all of a sudden everything yeah. sings. And it's always funny when we go to Europe and drink wine, it's rare that you drink wine on its own. You know, you get the Vindupé stuff and the pitcher wines of Italy, you know, that are just meant for, for because the drinking yeah. water, you know, can, can be questionable. No, Italians think you're alcoholic yeah. uh, if you're drinking wine without food. Right. Uh, I can tell you a million stories, but I won't. But suffice it to say, yeah, they usually drink with just food. Uh, and, uh, and I always love paella because I always picture paella as the neighborhood dish. So I come out of the front of my house and I put this big pan of rice down. And somebody walks up and going, hey, I got some fresh mussels and clams. I'll throw it into the rice. Hey, I got tomatoes out of the garden. I have got a little cherise uh, sausage I can throw in there. I have got fresh fish I just brought off the boat. All the neighbors throw their ingredients into that same pot of rice, and you get paella. It is a neighborhood-built dish. Yeah. That's Those why no two versions are ever going to be the same. White, red, or rosé, they yeah. all go with paella. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. And uh, as Dean talks about this next wine, this is one of the most historical wines that's ever been made here at Elise. Uh, the Nero Misto, we have got versions of this going back to the 80s. Um, this was one of the first efforts of taking people out of that 100% pursuit and going, we put all of this together because we thought it was delicious. Yeah. Um, and this is this is kind of celebrating. Well, talk about it, Dean. You tell me what it's celebrating. Well, I just mentioned Italy. Uh, Nero Misto is Italian, and if you translate it, it literally means black mix. Uh, what does that mean? Well, the old Italian immigrants that were coming over and settling in California were replicating their field blends from Italy. And by field blend, I mean they take an acre and they would plant three, four, five, six, seven different. Uh, red grape varietals, sometimes white as well, 
harvest them all together at the same time, put them all in one tank, and ferment and make a wine. Nowadays, we separate all these different grapes into a different tank, make a wine, and then blend afterwards. You, know, you didn't have a lot of space, these old school farmers. One tank, you're going to make the blend in the field. And so that pays homage to, uh, uh, to that uh, concept of taking a bunch of these different red grapes and throwing them together. Uh, this particular version of Nero Misto, like uh, a lot of the old uh, uh, California blends in the 1800s, uh, Zinfandel, Petite Syrah dominated, um, and then a smattering of a bunch of different grapes. Uh, uh, sometimes there's a splash of Merlot in this, sometimes Cab. Uh, what's, what's the other funky uh, varietal that I'm Barbera. Barbera. There's your, your little homage to Italy with this whole... Barbera in California was a tough one. It was, it, was, it was one of those grapes that could grow really well in the hills. And the problem is most of the Bordeaux varietals love the hills as well. And it was hard to get Barbera kind of a, a, a wedge. Uh, as an important grape. Uh, Barbera is one of my favorite Italian varietals, and so the original intention with the Italian name, right? Let, let's let's play that old field blend game. Yeah. Um, most of you experienced Zinfandel drinkers will know that the oldest Zinfandel vineyards, again, they have that field, that field blend component to it. Absolutely. There wasn't a sense of us getting together and doing blending trials. It was, let's grow all the flavors in the one vineyard that, yeah, uh, you, you didn't that have we to... want. Plus, these farmers are doing a lot of different things, too. Or they, they were making these wines uh, for the family. Had a little plot, and they were doing something else. So keep it simple, keep it easy, the original blends. Um, do you age wines? Do you age blends? Do blends Ooh. age the same as 100%? Does a mutt age the same way a purebred does? <laughs> Sometimes better. Okay. It, it depends on where these grapes are grown, the quality of the vineyards. Um, is all wine meant to age? No, not at all. Is that based on the wine making or is that based on the wine drinker? Well, who just, who age decides? Age from my cellar to my hand to my mouth. <laughs> well, I'm just curious. Who decides if a wine is ageable or not? Uh, is it you make it in that style or is it is it the response of the press and the enthusiast who goes, oh, that's really good after 10 years? Yeah, you know, like, great question. Great question because it's individual. Um, just because uh, a, a wine vintage chart says that you should... Dude, you're totally it. creeping into my zone, man. Back off. Oh, shit. That's four feet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> where was I at? <laughs> well, I was two feet close to you, but where... where oh, uh, so uh, just because a vintage chart says that this is the ideal time to drink it. Right. The ideal time is when you like it. Now, obviously... Uh, when the wines are younger, they have a little more power. Fruit is 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 young and centered, and then as they age, you start to get these tertiary aromas of flavors, of uh, earthiness. The fruit dries out, the earth comes up. A wine that's designed to age twenty years may be totally unappealing to you because you prefer it more fruit driven. So, what do you mean by design? By what do I mean by design? Like designed to age. Designed to age. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean? That means that uh, the idea is that we're making this, well, I should back up. One of the quantifiers for great wine is the ability to age long periods of time, 15, 20 years. I say one of the criteria, because again, not everybody likes those wines age, but uh, if it's designed to age, uh, you have the power and the ability for that wine to go the distance, even though you may not like the flavor profiles in that distance. Now, here's what the biggest, mis I'm not gonna say a misconception, okay? What I'm gonna say is, the, the thing that I think a lot of us wine drinkers don't 100% understand is, you're only required to have 75% of a grape to call it that wine on the label. All right. So I can call it Cabernet Merlot, Syrah, Petite Syrah. 25% of that wine could be other things. Yeah. So blending by its nature is, in my opinion, it's our effort to take what Mother Nature has provided us and to physically create something that we're considering more drinkable. There's an element where we're, 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 we're salting that steak a certain way. We're hot and high and low and slow to finish, you know? like So all of those decisions about how you cook a steak or do you like your egg scrambled or sunny side up, Everybody's got decisions they make. The blending for us is, you know, I can call it Cabernet and still want to blend. 
Yeah, the most that drinkability, that mouthfeel, that texture. Yeah, that, most you know, wines that say Cabernet on the lab, uh, label aren't 100% Cabernet. They're usually blends of two, three, four other grapes. And this is not to say, this is not a smoke and mirrors. Nobody's trying to get anything past you. The whole attempt is to make drinkable, delicious wine. And that's really the pursuit. And so the nature of this flight of wine that we're playing with today is drinkability is one of those really important words. It doesn't mean that there are undrinkable wines. There are. Uh, no. <laughs> I had one last night in Sangria. <laughs> what, I never had 100-point wine, but last night I had 10 10-point wines, and I think it ought to count. <laughs> um, no, but drinkability. And so, again, I think the creative element that we're getting satisfied from a blending standpoint is the fact that we're not waiting for that magical element for the vineyard to make that announcement. We're taking components and creating that flavor in our heads. There's a creativity involved in these blends that's really fun. So the whole theme, I think, of today's flight is infinite drinkability. These infinite are just drinkability. absolutely ID yeah. on the wine scale, man, mm -hmm. you know? And Nero Misto, the ultimate uh, hamburger and pizza wine. Uh, anything uh, just by virtue of its Italian name, anything Italian. Do, do you have a favorite blend on the planet? A traditional blend, like something that people already know is blended. Like, is there anything that your brain goes, oh, I like that? We already did it. GSM, Grenache, Syrah, Mervedra, whether it's in the uh, softer, more fruit forward, sassy bone style, or a drier, well, we're going to get to one, a drier, full bodied version of that. Because you could take that GSM blend and do a myriad of styles going up a big, full bodied, robust, but yeah. Uh, my soft spot is pretty much surrounded. So a lot of times we're going to make a single vineyard Cabernet or a single vineyard Zinfandel because that is the tradition of the winery. That is the vineyard we create our wines from every year. Um, we have one question. Oh, yes. Question. I love questions. Do wow. we use mega purple in our wines? Ah! <laughs> no. Not by design. No, 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 no. There are no adulterations to these wines. Yeah. If it is inky dark, that means that we have harvested later in the season we have reduced watering the vineyard to increase the pigment to, to liquid ratio. All of the wines that you will get from Elise Winery, these are all 100% pure wine. We are not adding things to it um, to create things that the proper harvest decisions and, and sound winemaking would often provide. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. All I'm saying is, is that these particular wines are pure grape juice without any of that super purple, any of that stuff. Yeah. So what are some of the grapes we use that add that beautiful dark color naturally to wines? Mm. Syrah? Syrah and Petite Syrah are probably Syrah. the two darkest. Petite Syrah is probably the darkest, yeah. Without a doubt. Um, um, what makes a wine dark? Okay, so when you start putting grapes into an environment where the soil below ground is not getting much water, the vine itself has to go into a priority mode and it has to ripen seed to propagate. So it will shape smaller and smaller grapes to protect that seed, but that's the, that's the intensity fulcrum we're looking for in the wine world. So when I get to that color, one vintage, and I'm like, that's perfect. Then in the back of your mind, you're like, that vineyard likes only so much water to get that grape that certain size to get to that color ratio I'm looking for. In the wine world, and this is really amazing for a lot of people that have never been out into a vineyard and drinking wine with us at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, the, the nature of walking these vineyards and, and getting a sense of why the terrain is such an important factor in creating these pigments and these colors, and it's one of the things that we pursue the most dramatically in the wine business because color is involving that other sense. Yeah, wine's you know, about all five senses. I want that visual, and, and there's certain times when you look at that luster in the glass and your brain goes, I already know I love that wine and I haven't even tasted it yet. Yeah. Um, and, and it's funny that we can't, there's no proofreading or, or nobody can really check your work to go, oh, there you go, you nailed the color. You know, and I gotta tell you, a lot of this comes back to the wine drinker. The more wine drinkers take our wines and, and drink them and come back to us going, I love that, I love that, I'm not so crazy about that, and I really love that. Every year we make these wines, our brain continually goes, everybody smiles when we do it this way. Yeah. Um, and so um, getting color naturally from a grape has a lot to do with farming first and foremost. Of course, in any industry, there are tricks. There are things we can do to play with the wines and create different flavors and aromas. The dead giveaway for us is the decanting trick. Any wine can be engineered, but as soon as you put it in a decanter and an hour later it falls off a cliff, 
chances are that's a heavily engineered or a very large production wine. Some of these wines you open them and go, I don't know if I like that wine, and you keep tasting it throughout a whole day. You might find it better six hours later than you did the moment you opened it. And that's the difference, I think, in a sound wine and an engineered wine. Is that an over-the-top answer or that, that uh, nice? It was over-the-top. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What's our rule here, Elise? If it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ooh, we got one more? There's no way we're going to do these tastings without continually playing with the library here. So now we're going to get to, it's kind of nice bookends, same shape bottle, by the way, which is poetic. The Sessi Bon is your warmer climate combination of your Grenache and your Syrah and then your, your peripheral players, your, your Carignans and Merveds and whatnot. D'Aventure was a project here to lease that took the same typical grapes, the Grenaches and the Syrahs and the Merveds, but in cooler conditions and in higher elevations. So now you're able to focus these vineyards into a little bit deeper, darker wine, and you don't have to harvest it as early as you do in those warmer climates, and you've got a longer um, color addition. You've got more structure, and so this was the whole more nature. Heft. And that is exactly why you separated the two. Yeah. Um, I'm going to let you start with this one. It is a 2000 Daventure. 2000? Yeah. Help my math. 2020 minus It's got to be at least 20-some years, man. 20-some years. Oh, yeah. I don't care. You, I don't know. Metric system out there, anyone? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can yours be done metrically? You know, it's really funny. I think the wine business uh, is one of the only industries in America that uses the metric system. It is, yeah. 750, 750 milliliters, right? right? All right, six liter bottles. All right, stupid that. trivia, because we're just going to do it. we got a couple of extra minutes. Does anybody know why a wine bottle is exactly the size that it is? Who decided that that was the universal format to deliver and sell wine? It fits in the cup holder of your car. Right? <laughs> No. It fit in the cherry odd. That was a joke. <laughs> not drink and drive to the lease. And if you are fine members of CHP out there, uh, that's absolutely a joke. It was a joke. Um, so, the whole message, alcohol and religion, have a very interesting combined history. So the church decided, and if you look at a lot of references to three cups of wine, if you take a wine bottle and measure the fluid in that bottle, it is three cups of wine plus a little splash. The splash, of course, you're supposed to pour on the ground to give back to the gods that gave you the great wine in the first place. Oh, your homie gods. I'm just saying, bam! Yeah. <laughs> it didn't touch. So 750 milliliters is literally two people, three small cups of wine. That's exactly why that size was that, the universal format. <laughs> All right, we're talking aged wine now. This is 20 years in bottle. Oof. Um, Oof. The color is still like, I'm seeing just on the edges, you're starting to get a little of that brick red. That's totally normal for, for, for aged wine. Um, the thing I love about a style of wine that's able to age is you get to pick your time in history when you want to enjoy that wine. There's no sort of, uh, a requirement to go drink this in 10 years, drink it in five years. When you've got a well-made wine that can age like this, you can decide, I like them softer, more perfumed, I can wait the 15 years. I like them more bold and a little drier, I can drink them in their youth. But a well-made wine, in my opinion, should respond to both of those intentions. Yeah, well, a well-made wine has the ability to give you all these flavor profiles when you want them. Uh, and the beauty of an aged wine is the only way to get these flavors is to sit on that bottle or pay us to sit on it. Oh, man. We've done that for you. This is interesting. We opened this uh, before the show went live, um, and the wine was actually showing a little more acidity. It actually had a little bit more tartness to it. Instead of being an older 20-year-old wine that had this, like, 15-minute arc of drinkability, and then she kind of tailed off and, and died... Uh, this is actually building momentum. This is getting bigger and deeper the longer this thing has been open. Again, that is a huge mark, I think, of a well-made wine that it continues to evolve. Now, again, anybody that's not an experienced drinker for older wines, it's not going to give you the freshness that you get from a current release wine. No, no. This it's... is going to give you definitely the balance. This is, but man, this has still got some tannin to it. It's got some pretty serious fruit to it. it, it... It's a beautiful wine. It's you got these tertiary aromas of, I call it cigar box. You open a humidor, 
and you smell and you get a pop of cedar and a pop of sweet tobacco that's in here this is a walk through mere woods when you kick up the forest floor and you smell just that i call it kind of a gross descriptor but the sweet smell of decay there's a sweetness <laughs> and an earthiness that's absolutely that's awesome. beautiful and you can only get it one way you've got to sit and wait on this bottle uh, uh and the fruit is dried fruit. You know, when this was young, the fruit popped as young fruit. It's like a Ziploc bag full of ripe Bing cherries. You smell it. And then you have a Ziploc bag full of those same cherries sun-dried for two weeks. Your brain knows they're cherries, but they're different interpretations of the cherry. This is the sun-dried fruit, and it can only come with that age. I mean, 20 years old, and it has just given up all of the... Okay, and, and just for, for those of you that need to look it up real quick, because I know I had to, tertiary. Tertiary, yes. Right? So people are like, tertiary, I'm I'm a Virgo, tertiary. I don't think I know what tertiary is. You know? oh, yeah. <laughs> I looked it up before I came on. Tertiary meaning third level? Yeah, uh, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary. So, anybody graduating school, yeah, the, the the flavors and tastes of youth, uh, a little bit of age. Tertiary is hanging towards the end of that uh, wine, uh, but things that only can come after one, two, and three: first grade, second grade, third grade. You can't I skipped get around a lot, man. Yeah. I don't know that. Yeah, I got held back. Yeah. How about an example of a tertiary flavor? Uh, well, what I mentioned before, that, uh, that uh, forest floor earthiness. Now, think about wine. When it's young, fruit is all L.A. Look at me, look at me. Uh, it, it's, it's forward. It's in your face. Like Van Nuys or the Valley or like, more like Tarzana? Like, what you know, are we talking about in L.A.? I just right? realized that was probably not a good analogy. Manhattan Beach represent? You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> so, what am I trying to say? In your youth, vibrant fruit, that's... That's what stands up. All these earthen flavors are in the wine. You yeah. just can't, you can't get to them yet. The, All the primary flavors are the ingredients. Tertiary is when the whole soup comes together. Whole soup comes I together. Did, that flavor doesn't exist without those components being added together. They yep. would not exist on their own. And, yeah, and as, as the wine uh, ages, the fruit starts to be less obvious, and then the earthen flavors and aromas start to come out. I think it was really interesting. When I drink a lot of the 100% wines, I keep coming back to the, the you know, standalone drinkability or the food elements. Every single one of these wines immediately evoked some kind of culinary, you know, the summertime, you know, yeah. a little richer now. You're, you know, people are just showing up. You got your peaches and your prosciutto, you know. Now the things are starting to come off the barbecue and we got a little of the early, uh, you know, shore ribs. Yeah. You know, now we're getting more complicated and we're getting into the, or I should say paella. Then you get into your short ribs. And then mm -hmm. once the people that don't drink as much wine start to gather their kids and go home, then you open the 2000 tub and sure. And that's when you can have more for daddy. Uh, you had these three first. You're right? sitting in the front. People have started to go home. Now your glass is a little fuller. Yeah. You maybe open to a slightly more selfish wine. Maybe that's the word we should leave with today. Selfish. Don't wine. be afraid to be selfish with Don't your wine out there, selfish. man. You know it's okay. What would you eat with it? Consider us a support group. Um, <laughs> actually, the first thing that popped in my head with this wine was the barbecued eel of sushi. Ooh. It really made me want that. Uh, that what, what's the? I'm not no. Uni is a sea urchin. What am I thinking of? What's the? Anyone? Unagi. 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 Is Shout that the? Is that the barbecued here, here. eel uh, uh, in sushi? Um, anyway, it's the first thing it made me think of is because it's not the overly sweet barbecue sauce. Again, it's the garlic and the ginger and the mirin and the it really has all of those uh, components to it. And uh, because of it being 20 years old and being a slightly more delicate, not as powerhouse red, yeah. that's where I think you can bring in some of the, the, the oil. I tend to pair acidity and oil. So if I'm going to go a little um, refined acidity, then I'll bring a little heavier oil in terms of the, the eel or something like That's that. Pairing. Pairing, so. I'd go, I'd go a, a slice of rare prime rib, simple. Oh, you know, so now, <sighs> how am I supposed to go home tonight and I could not have prime rib, man? Well, have you the know, eel like, first and the prime rib, yes. Head, you know? Have both. Uh, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, it, it's really been awesome. Um, again, go to the Elise website. We will never taste anything that's not available. Um, and think about Thursday because some of the vintages, again, that did not get the big uh, standing ovation have turned out to be some of the really great wines uh, uh, in terms of longevity and drinkability. 
and so um, the whole theme for Thursday is going to be uh, no matter what the critics say, I really like this wine. <laughs> so thank you very much, and we'll see you guys on Thursday. Cheers.